Jehovah said, Have faith in thy Creator, and a good work done unto my little ones, behold, I will provide. Whatever thou dost unto them, even so dost thou unto me, wherein thou shalt not fail. Neither shalt thou strive to teach any adult man or woman who is without faith in me. Behold, my people are infants in this era. The Book of Jehovah's Kingdom on Earth, Chapter 1, Verses 12 and 13. Hello, friends and neighbors, and welcome to OASPE Pals. It's the show where two non-believers read through the OASPE and try not to be jerks about it. We are your humble sons of Jehovah. I'm Dave White, and with me as always, the Sarges to my Sueys, Rob Brunskill. Rob, how are you today? I'm doing well. I'm good. Good. Anything exciting happening? Oh, well, it's nice to be in the uh, remote, hidden uh, location for the uh, the lodge. Yes. If uh, Rob sounds a little peevish today, that's because we attempted to record this last week and had a catastrophic audio failure. So uh, this is our second try at recording this episode. Now, for those of you at home not familiar with the OSB, it is a 1,000 page book written by dentist and spiritualist John Blue Newbrow through the process of automating writing. Essentially, for 50 weeks, half an hour every day, he would sit down at his typewriter and let the Spirit of God flow through him and type. That's three pages a day. If they had Nano Remo in 1880, our boy Johnny B would be crushing it. The result is a Bible for our coming age, the Cosmon Era. Newbrow and some followers established a new religion based on this called Faithism, which eventually led them to establish an ill-fated colony in the desert of New Mexico. Uh, today we're reading the Book of Jehovah's Kingdom on Earth, which containeth within it the Book of Shalem. It was the last book in the original 1882 edition of the OASB, though later printings add a supplementary Book of Discipline after it in the reading order. If you'd like to read along with us at home, the specific text we're using is from The Light of Cosmon, a collection of the doctrinal books published by the British Confraternity of Faithists in 1939. It omits some of the 28 historical books that occur between the Book of Jehovah and the Book of Judgment, or some 83% of the total text. I only really picked this version because it's a little easier on the eyes, to be honest. Yeah. Rob, have you done the required reading? Yes, I have. All right. Well, let's dive right into it. This is the Book of Jehovah's Kingdom on Earth, which contains within it the Book of Shalem, all of which is anti-script. So there's a little footnote in this edition after the word anti-script, explaining that it is, uh, let's see what the footnote says exactly. Well, you know, the first thought is, anti-script you think well anti-matter or something like that it's it's not script it's anti-script but that's not it's ant anti-e a-n-t-e well the actual definition at the bottom of the page is we understand by this term and also by the book itself what is set forth as being in the past has not yet occurred i mean if only there was some word for some sort of writing that is about things that have yet to happen uh, some it strikes me that there's probably some very common word for it, but it's it's just on the tip of my tongue. I, I can't place it. Can you? No, I can't. There's probably something, but I suppose antiscript will have to do. Yeah. So my, I don't know about you, but my experience of reading this book was that it was very front-loaded. Like, there was a lot of interesting stuff going on at the beginning, and then it tailed off real hard. Oh, definitely. That is definitely the case. So let's start off with chapter one, where Jehovah starts his kingdom on earth. In the early days of the Cosmon era, we have a man named Tay? Tai? I don't know I, how it's pronounced. In my head, I heard it as Tay. So. Okay, well, let's go with Tay. That's good enough. <laughs> Tay is a uh, man who is esteemed wise and good above all others, a representative man, and therefore he is called Tay. This seems like a absolutely meaningless uh, etymology for the word. It's probably good to know that one of the big things in the OASB's cosmology is that all nations of the Earth were once united in a giant supercontinent called Pan, which gave us all a universal or panic language. <laughs> panic is definitely a good word for this writing. but Yeah. Well, after the continent gets sunk beneath the waves and mankind gets split up, there's a sort of a Tower of Babel thing where all our languages drift apart. Um, anyways, in the original panic language... Te means the highest general expression of something. So basically we're saying he's a good guy. I can see where the author uh, definitely intended that to be the case. Te comes out of the land of us, uh, which is a term that appears repeatedly throughout the OASB. It's another panic word. It specifically refers to the vanishment of things seen into being unseen. But in a general sense here, it's used to refer to the kingdom of those who reject 
spirituality and faithism, and who've embraced the beast of materialism. Yes, and a thinly veiled reference to the U.S., I think. And also, I think, to us. True. Yeah. Tay gathers around him a bunch of followers, and he does what any righteous man does. He prays to Jehovah to tell him what to do. Jehovah tells him, go found the kingdom of Jehovah on earth. And Tay's response is very much like uh, Bill Cosby in his Noah sketch. He goes, and how do I do that? (laughs) Yes. Well, I, yeah, the uh, gathering those around him, I I did like, uh, Tay answered saying, behold, O Jehovah, I have gathered together many men and many women. They all profess a desire to found the kingdom. One desire to be a teacher, another to be a superintendent, another an overseer. Another an advisor. So by my count, it's himself and he's got four other people with him. At, at least four other people. I mean, there's probably <laughs> other people he's not mentioning. Like, he, he doesn't have to mention Todd, the janitor, and, and all the other people who are just, you know, helping out. Yeah, I suppose he doesn't. But at least four people. God admittedly here has given him a rather broad remit. So he narrows it down a little for Tay and he says, Go find some babies and take them out into the desert and raise them to be super people. Yes, I, I do like the, the, I mean, the specific quote. Jehovah answered Tay saying, Go seek and bring out of us orphan babes and cast away infants and foundlings. So, yeah, basically God saying, What you need to do is start by rounding up a whole mess of kids. <laughs> that phrase, orphan babes and cast away infants and foundlings, is repeated verbatim in the OASB any time he refers to the children of Shalem. John Belude Newbrow loves his repetition. And that's just one of the phrases he's just going to beat into your head by the time this book is over. Definitely loves his repetition. And I do like... Does he love his repetition? <laughs> he loves his repetition. And I do like Tay's, Tay's uh, response to that, which is fantastic if you take it out of context. Tay inquired, what can a man do with babes? I think I have definitely seen some advertisements in the back of comic books and other magazines telling me what a man can do with babes. But it's a it's a fair response. It's like, what what do I know from babies? Yes. But needless to say, Jehovah gets a little peevish at that response. And he says, cowboy up and get her done. Basically, he gives a short little quote, which we gave at the top of the episode, which is essentially, do my work and I will provide, which he ends with the phrase, behold, my people are infants in this era, which... Okay, yes, he is specifically referring to the little babies, but I also get a little undercurrent of, holy crap, this is the best guy on earth, and he (laughs) cannot think for himself. Yeah, that's definitely the case. Let's get to chapter two, which I have subtitled, Tay rounds up some babies and gets a girlfriend. (laughs) Or my subtitle, S. So Tay gathers up a great number of orphan babes and castaway infants and foundlings, and Jehovah sends him a woman named S to help take care of the children. Yeah, I like Tay's immediate question. <laughs> Knowest thou the care of infants? And she answered him saying, In such labor, alas, I have no experience, but I know Jehovah will guide me all right. Otherwise, he had not inspired my soul unto the work. All wisdom is possible through Jehovah. So going into interview, so what are your qualifications? Just look at it going, qualifications? Yes. Uh, the, the whole all wisdom is possible through Jehovah is a very good attitude to have. You know, all things are possible in God. But there's also the phrase, the Lord helps those who helps themselves, which the faithists here do not appear to believe in very much. If you are capable of anything, it is only because it is Jehovah acting through you. Uh, and yet, in spite of the fact that Jehovah could conceivably impart this knowledge to anyone, note that it is only a woman who is allowed to take care of the babies. Yes, it is. Yeah. Faithism is very big on reinforcing traditional gender roles for some strange reason. A lot of 19th century cults and religions that sprung up were very big on gender equality. That was a huge net of their appeal. So it's strange to see one where that isn't the case. Tay likes the answers, such being thy faith. Thou art the first chosen woman in the father's new kingdom. You're in. (laughs) And uh, it was an interesting note. I mean, I suppose first chosen woman could be referencing oh you are the first one we've picked but you know initially he did say he had a whole bunch of men and women but s is the first chosen woman maybe she's chosen in the same way that tay himself is chosen i suppose so it's worth noting that s is the most important woman in the whole oaspie 
so important that she is only appearing here first time on page 805 and that she is going to vanish for 12 pages before she appears again. And also, like Tay, her name is a concept, not an exact name. Yes. Uh, S is also the spirit world. Yeah. Presumably because she is strong in faith and a gift from Jehovah. There is also a separate character in the OSB who is S, the daughter of Jehovah. I don't think this is the same character, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> it's possible. Yeah. Obviously, they've got a bunch of babies. S can take care of the babies, but, you know, she needs a support system. So they need more folks. So what do the faithists do here? They take out a classified ad in the newspaper. Now, this is a recommendation from God, though, because Tay has no idea that this is something yes. they should do. He wants to get asked, hey, uh, now it's me and S and a whole bunch of kids. What do we do? <laughs> well, you take out a want ad. Wanted, 50 men and women who are faithists in Jehovah and are willing to take part in founding the Father's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And they run this in the papers, and they get... How many job applicants do they get? Do they get a couple dozen? Well, they claim it to be thousands. Wow. It is a down economy, so people are just jumping at those jobs. Yeah. Tay spake to the multitude, saying, I called for 50 men and women, and lo, there are thousands willing to take part in founding the Father's kingdom on earth. This, of course, is uh, once again phrased as a plea to Jehovah, and Jehovah once again is forced to give Tay the specific advice of, like hey, maybe you should do some job interviews or something. Like, weed out the people who are just in it for the money and and who are, you know, not really into it. Well, and I like how it's basically Tay saying to the multitudes that he put the job application for, hey, anybody know what we're supposed to be doing here? Yeah, and that brings us to chapter three. Tay conducts some job interviews, which is, for some reason, the longest chapter in the book for no particular reason. <laughs> There's a thousand people. He needs to one of those down to 50. We get a bunch of individual job interviews. First up, we get Sada, who appears to be either a CEO or an economist or a city planner of some sort, who promises to create harmonious relations between labor and capital without giving any specifics about how he's going to do that. Well, it does say that the capitalist shall receive good profit on his capital and the laborer high and uniform wages. Yes, I know that's the first thing I look for when I'm establishing a perfect society is to make sure that the capitalists are properly reimbursed. Yes, and adjust them so that they can live side by side equally and neither above nor under the other. So it is sort of a communist idea. You know, we're all going to share equally. In this. Sure, but if the capitalists are equal to the laborers, the capital, like, where's the capital coming from? It's a very strange idea of how things work. Sutta is followed by several others who had similar plans, but each one doubted the other's capacity as being qualified for the work. Yes, everyone liked this, but no one could really agree on who should be the one to determine what was fair and equal. Sutta is followed by Aborn, who gets things off to a great start by saying that Sutta is an idiot, that labor and capital are natural enemies, as are men and women. Yes, Aborn spake next. He said, I have heard Sutta's project. It is a farce. Capital and labor cannot harmonize. I mean, I'm inclined to agree with him, but that's for different reasons. <laughs> Uh, but he loses me when he says that the best way to serve Jehovah is for Aborn personally to impregnate as many women as possible so that they will have his superior babies. Well, his basic premise is that, you know, the only way people work together is if they're all blood related as family, which I'm sure there are people out there that can assure you that all families always work together in harmony. Yes. Aborn himself, again, proposes that he be the one to impregnate all the women. Uh, and then others spake in a like manner, but each one preferred himself as the prospective father of the offspring. Of course. Uh, Aborn is followed by Thirtis. She gives the gender-flipped version of Aborn's argument that her best way of serving Jehovah is for her to have all the superior babies, and also that while this is going on, she should basically be treated like a goddess, and all the men should leave her the hell alone. Well, I liked her, her first uh, proposal, which was, during the period of gestation, man should not approach woman. Basically, all the men should go away and not come back until the baby is born. Needless to say, she is uh, followed by a group of people. Then spake many of the women after the same manner, and each one doubted the other's capacity to fill the place, but recommended herself. <laughs> yes, all the women liked it, but they couldn't agree on who should be the chosen woman. Thirdus is followed by Amos, who I... I actually kind of liked because his section is brief and he's relatively honest. 
Well, I certainly like the majestic way in which he introduces himself. It is a very yeah. majestic piece of scripture. Amos spake next. He said, I have heard all these beautiful systems. I am ready for any of them. Behold, I am a landscape gardener. I think we should all introduce ourselves <laughs> when popcorning that way. You know, Behold, I am a user interface developer. <laughs> of course, the what thing is... Labor isn't included on his part. Yes, uh, he basically says he's a landscape gardener. Well, not really a landscape gardener per se. He's a guy who designs landscape gardens. And if they want to employ him, they're going to have to hire a bunch of people to do, like, the actual gardening. And he generally represents all professionals, which I thought that was a fascinating choice to go with that. And not the mention of the 500 doctors and 500 lawyers who expressed similar views. Well, just when you think we are going to get uh, every possible job interview under the sun, we cut those off short. Well, they, they do mention, the last one they mention is, next spake a thousand teachers of the piano, each one offering to teach the young for the father's kingdom. Yeah, and that's where he starts to realize, you know what, I need to move on here. I like the mention that there are specifically a thousand teachers of the piano because earlier he said that only a thousand people total had shown up. So <laughs> yeah. all these people are piano teachers on the side. <laughs> Apparently. But yes, at this point, basically take it's the idea of maybe I should hurry this chapter along. So next we get the recriminations. All the representatives of the major face of the world come and tell him that he's got it wrong and that he's going to hell. Yes, we get 500 priests of Brahma. The Hindus say that the end of the world will be the second coming of Brahma, who will come in flames of fire from the east and west and north and south, and through the magic touch of his wand, he will sort the castes of men into their proper order. That at least sounds vaguely Brahma-ish. Yeah. Uh, they are followed by Buddhists, who say the end of the world will be the second coming of Buddha, who will come with two swords and twelve spears and ten thousand brides. <laughs> yes. Plus they add in the dis. As for Brahma and his second coming... For that matter, he never came once. Oh, <laughs> burn! Burn, that's hard. I like to mention that he has two swords and 10,000 brides because we all know one thing that uh, Buddha is big on. It is moderation. All things in moderation. <laughs> yes, moderate. Two swords and 12 spears and 10,000 brides. A moderate amount of brides. Right. I mean, he's Buddha. He could have any bride he wants, but he only brought the choicest 10,000. They are followed by the Christians. Are you familiar with the Christians? I've never heard of Christians before. Well, you know them better as Christians. Ah. Yes, but a key tenet here of the Oaspe is that all the world religions are actually false religions established by evil spirits who have usurped the teachings of genuinely true and wise individuals. So there is a Jesus of Nazareth, and he did preach a, a beautiful gospel, and sometime around the Council of Nicaea, his whole faith was stolen by an evil spirit named Louis Among, uh, who renamed himself Christe, the All-Wise, and took over the religion and made it a religion of violence. Okay, then. Yes. So they're modern Christians. You worship an evil demon. The Christians basically say that the second coming of Christe will be the end of the world, and he will come in a sea of fire with millions of archangels and conquer the world by the sword. Once all the religions have spoken, Tay basically shuts them all down. When many others had thus spoken, Tay said unto them, I called for such as had faith in Jehovah. I am not in the labor of founding a kingdom for Brahma, nor Buddha, nor Christe, nor for anyone but the Creator, our Heavenly Father. To all such I say, go your ways. I have no use for you. Yes, yeah, seriously, guys, did you actually read the help wanted ad? I were <laughs> calling for, for your kind here. And then he responds by kicking out the people who are only in for the money. Your yeah. faith being in money? I have no use for you. I called for those with faith in Jehovah. Therefore, go your ways also. And also, the self-appointed leaders should also just yeah. get out. Behold, the signs of the times show us that, as to refounding the Father's kingdom by words, sermons, and lectures, they are worthless. Yes, that is a struck me as a, a quip against self-help gurus. Yes. Deeds, not words. <laughs> By the time Tay is done kicking out everybody he doesn't like, they're back down to the original 50 he was looking for, and they're hired on the spot. Yes. Which brings us to chapter 4, the founding of Shalem. It's mostly Tay setting out his mission statement for Shalem, which is essentially just repeating what Jehovah told him back to do in chapter 1. 
take a bunch of babies out in the desert and raise them to be perfect people. Yeah, it struck me as just the, this particular chapter, just a, it's prayer time. We're going to talk about what we plan to do. So they find the land of Shalem, and it is called Shalem because Tay said it would be called Shalem. That's the etymology given in the book. The exact quote is, And Tay and his people went away to an unoccupied country by the river Shalem, so called because Tay had said, I take the babes the Uzzians would not have, and I come to a place where the Uzzians would not live, and yet I will make it a piece of peace and plenty, and therefore it shall be called Shalem. Now, it's possible that Shalem means peace and plenty? On the other hand, unlike every other word in the book, it is not given a clear etymology, which is unusual because, man, John Blue Newbrow loves telling you what secret words really mean. I mean, I suppose it could be a, war a warping of shalom or shalom. Tay then uh, launches into a little uh, screed against the modern world, which I, f I found interesting from a modern perspective because his basic take, it's not that people are evil, it's that people are not good, which sort of reminds me of the discussions we're having about racism in this day and age. Yeah, I could definitely see that. At this point, the chapter basically devolves into a series of rituals and prayers. Everyone draws themselves into a sacred circle, which is either the place of the Holy Covenant or the place of the Sacred Covenant, depending on which chapter you're looking at. And they make a covenant with Jehovah, giving over their body and soul for swearing the ownership of personal property, any self-interest, and uh, bizarrely, not to criticize anyone over the age of 14. Yeah, because when you're leading somebody on a uh, risky venture like this, you, you don't want to hear a lot of criticism and talk back on the subject uh let's see they also promised to be pacifists vegetarians and teetotalers and to raise the babies as their own kin to know the glory of jehovah to develop their suis and sargis which is not explained in the chapter but means esp to teach them books and instruments trades and occupation music and worship dancing and gymnastics and then to kick them out of the colony when they turn 14. To a degree, this kind of struck me as uh, their version of maybe what was meant to be like the Lord's Prayer, although it is definitely not short and snappy like the Lord's Prayer. I would have hated to have uh, had to memorize something like this. Once uh, this covenant has been made, Jehovah speaks through Tay and promises to provide for the faithless of Shalem in the same way that they are providing for the babies and tells them to proclaim the founding of Jehovah's kingdom on earth in the east and west and north and south. And with the both literalism of Tay and the love of repetition of John Blue Newbrow, we get four verses where he does exactly that. They're phrased exactly the same, except that the cardinal direction differs in each one of them. Let me hear all the East people go, yeah! Let me hear all the West people go, yeah! And uh, yeah, Tay definitely had a DJ side to him. Chapter 6, verse 20, we get our first mention of Satan in the book. Now, I should stress this is Satan with a lowercase s. There is a capital S Satan in the Oaspi, but this is lowercase s Satan, meaning that it is probably just intended to be used in the general sense of adversary. As Satan, in the management of his soldiers for war purposes, had demonstrated the advantage of power through discipline, let us be wise in the Father's kingdom by discipline also, but in peace and righteousness. Essentially, you know, I don't like the devil. He's evil. But, you know... He does make a couple good points about management. We need order, just not, you know, force and being violent. Anyways, after establishing a covenant with God, the faithists all establish a covenant with each other, essentially establishing a hierarchy for how the colony will run. This is not necessarily internally consistent with some of the other ideas in the book, which basically argues that the best government is no government, but we'll let that slide for now. The basic structure is that everyone divides into groups of ten, and the wisest man in each group is promoted chief. Now that still is going to leave them with at least five chiefs. So they need a chief of chiefs. And what would be a good name, you think, for the chief of chiefs? Uh, I'm not sure. Perhaps some sort of new creative name or... Uh, super chief. Yeah, super chief. Big chief. Something. Uh, anyways, the name that they settle on is the Chichief. Like, this is some sort of weird expanded universe novel and they're all clone Jedis. Or they are Chichias. Then they actually get around to the process of organizing Shalem in chapters 7 to 10. 
Uh, they split into all the groups that are necessary for the functioning of society. Do you know what those groups are off the top of your head there, Rob? I actually have them written down here. Oh, I mean, I can go through them. Let's... We need architects, clothiers, dietitians, engineers, manufacturers, horticulturists, agriculturists, botanists, nurses, physicians, artists, musicians, bloggers, joggers, manicurists, pedicurists, sweepers, sleepers, pickers, grinners, lovers, sinners, jokers, smokers, midnight tokers. I've, I think I've wandered into a Steve Miller band song yeah. uh you can forget everything after musicians there that's, 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 <laughs> yes. that is the whole list there are 12 different types of people that society needs and that list ends after musicians no second class telephone sanitizers none of that just to repeat the shortened list that's architects clothiers dietitians engineers manufacturers horticulturalists agriculturalists botanists nurses physicians artists and musicians i'm a little confused by the fact that there are essentially three different types of people growing plants in that group well, for different purposes. They're growing plants for different purposes. I suppose, but what's the difference between... <laughs> if you've got a horticulturist and agriculturist, what do you need with a generalized botanist? <laughs> well, I suppose if they're going out into nowhere, they, they expect to be finding plants they don't know about? I have no. no idea. Since there are supposed to be 10 people in each of these groups, and there are only 52 people, that basically means they're doubling up on a lot of these jobs. It also means... There are 12 chiefs out of only 52 people. 52 is an interesting number at this point, because I'm recalling that at the very beginning of all of this, Tay went to God and said, look, I have a whole bunch of people with me, men and women, who want to found your kingdom on earth. And then God said, you know, go hire some people. And, you know, Tay got 50 out of that. So yeah, 50 plus Tay plus S. So there's 52. And, I'm left wondering, what happened to the original people here? <laughs> I bet it's some sort of mergers and acquisitions type thing where they make everybody re-interview for their own job. Yeah, I guess that was the case. Yeah, they, they didn't make the cut. Sorry. I mean, it sucks to be you. All these groups, of course, elect their chiefs. Tay, of course, is elected Chichief, as if there was ever any doubt of that. Yeah, big surprise. I mean, he's the only named character other than S in the book so far who is sticking around. Right. But it is important to point out that no one is above anyone here. No, no one is above anyone else, except for the guy who makes all the decisions. And what's his first decision? To tell everyone what their duties are. Right. He's going to tell them all how to do their own jobs, because they don't know how to do that. Most of these are pretty bland. He just kind of goes to the architects, closures, and dietitians. He realizes he's getting a little bit boring, and he just punts it off to the next section. I mean, this particular chapter, chapter eight, he just tells the architects, clothiers, and dietitians what they need to do. And not surprising, it's the architects need to build houses, clothiers need to make clothes, dietitians need to feed everybody. But in every case, it ends with, oh, and uh, have the kids help you. <laughs> right. I'm a little sad that he cut himself off after the dietitians because I really wanted to see how he would distinguish the instructions between the agriculturalists and the botanists and the horticulturalists. Yeah, we, we never quite get that distinction made. Uh, then he gives everyone a pep talk, which contains the disturbing phrase, all mortals are in an embryonic state preparing for birth, parentheses, commonly called death, end parentheses. Uh, chapter nine is largely about establishing the rules for the school where the children will be educated. It's basically a sort of Montessori school combined with a trade school with a heaping dollop of, of religious instruction. Yes. I mean, he, he insists the kids are going to have it all. They're going to have a garden, observatory, a laboratory, a factory, orchards, fields, gardens, moats, stoats. Uh, I'm going off again. The last thing, the most important thing, though, that they need to learn is angel communion. And I mean, I believe this is where they actually give a little description of it, where they basically put the kids in a circle. That's a holy circle. And while they're in the circle, they can see and talk to angels. And that's how it works. That's a very concise and detailed explanation of well, how it works. I am now reconsidering my preschool and kindergarten experience, which was essentially just me being put in circles with other children. <laughs> then we have the argument between the celibate and the non-celibate members over who should have the important job of raising the infants. Should it be people who've already had children and raised some children? Or should it be people who don't have children of their own? Yeah, this is a very important argument that they bring to Tay. And Tay's answer is, what do you want an answer from me for? <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Jehovah eventually speaks through him to give an answer. That answer is basically, uh, everybody sucks at raising children, so might as well let anyone do it. 
Well, I mean, the he does task them with, hey, so go out, go out to us and look at how the children are raised there and ask yourself, have they been raised right? And generally their answer is no, nobody's been raised right. Their parents all had something that they overlooked that let the children not be properly raised. Uh, so parents always have a blind spot for their kids. And uh, so that that was the answer. Well, if parents always have a blind spot for their kids, then obviously married couples who have raised kids before cannot be trusted to raise kids. So we have to put these kids in the hands of the celibate who have not be previously raised kid. So why then, since those who have raised children have been failures, you shall surely not choose them. The celibate made no failures, for they have not tried. Which, for a moment, seems sort of clever and insightful, until you realize all of the married people were, in this context, celibates before they had their children. Yeah. <laughs> it's like asking, well, who's the better doctor? A doctor who's had a patient die or somebody who's never gone to med school. <laughs> and you say, well, you know, the doctor's had a patient die, but the person who's gone to, who has not gone to med school has never had a patient die. So let's defer to the person who's never gone to med school. <laughs> That's a very good point. With that argument settled, we get through chapters 11 to 16, which is basically summed up as the land of Shalem flourishes. Well, flourishes in some interesting ways. One of the first things that Jehovah brings up is, Behold, the ancients built their temples so durable that succeeding generations forgot the art of building. Better it is for man's talent to remain than for stones and pillars of iron. So, yeah, you know the problem with the you know, buildings? They're built too well. Build your buildings to fall apart. You want a Ryan home. Yeah, it's... For, for which reason in Cosmon thou shalt not build imperishably in corporeal things, but rather leave the way open for succeeding generations to build also. So you know what, guys? Let's build stuff that's only going to last like 20 years tops. So, and then has to be replaced. Scriptural planned obsolescence. Well, we get a, a detailed descriptions of some of those buildings. Uh, the Temple of Jehovah, for instance has uh, fountains and gongs, a Chinese-style prayer wheel, murals depicting astronomical phenomena in the Ethereum heavens, beautiful flags, and a throne of light, whatever the hell that is. Yes. Um, what does Tay say when he sees that? <laughs> Who but gods could have made anything so beautiful with such cheap material? That is, uh, wow, that is some backhanded compliments there. Never has something so grand been built with twine and paper mache all this tells me is that John Blue Newbrow has never done set building for a high school musical. <laughs> the Uzzians come to see the New Kingdom, and they are both confused and impressed. Uh, I believe the exact quote here is, Why has this not been tried before? A people without a leader. <laughs> yes. Uh, they say this to Tay, who is standing right there calling all the shots. Uh, we get a description of the Temple of Apollo. Uh, the most salient feature here is that it has a mural of Apollo looking at a group of drucks with long arms, and I'm expecting you do not know what trucks are. Uh, no, I, like, well, I kind of assumed based on the description and the implication that they were turned into something beautiful implying man, that they were meant to be monkeys as a reference to evolution. That's, that's pretty close. Drucks are generally subhuman people who seek to do evil. They're kind of a step below Uzzians, maybe. Not just that they have turned away from Jehovah, but are active malefactors. Okay. Uh, let's see, there's also a fancy gymnasium and then a bunch of other buildings which clearly aren't nearly as important because the author doesn't spend a page and a half describing them. And, well, he gets to, he gets 20 paragraphs in describing all these buildings in some degree of detail and gets to, and not least interesting of all, was the house of the nurseries. And that is the extent of the description of the not least interesting thing of all. Right. It's only the centerpiece of this entire project where the children are raised. But, you, you know, you know what a nursery looks like. I don't have to describe one to you. Anyways, the voice of Jehovah continually urges Tay and S. He's showing up again now after an absence of some 12 pages. Get more babies, get more babies, get more babies. Yes. Uh, S is the only one who actually does any of the work. I mean, it's sort of hand-waved over here, but she gets... 20 to 50 new orphans a year. 
That's a pretty good churn. At some point, there are more than a thousand orphans in the colony. Yes, in in not that many years. Yeah. Which, I mean, assuming like they started with maybe 500, if you add 500 more, I mean, it's 10 years. If you're getting 50 a year, that's still 10 years. Yeah. If you're getting 20, that's that's more. So 10 to 25 years of orphans. Uh, at one point, the cows on their farm become sick. I don't know why they have cows, because they are vegans. Yeah. Uh, but the cows become sick, so they feed the babies uh, essentially milk substitute made out of corn milk and slippery elm bark and flaxseed and rice milk. Well, they the first is just corn. They press the milk and boil it. Mm, but then milk. the chemists, which I, I didn't know we had chemists. I don't think chemists were previously on the job list, but they have chemists now. Maybe chemists are part of the manufacturers. There are certainly no scientists in, in uh, Shelm. Yeah, they, they make the water extracts from slippery elm bark flaxseed combined with rice milk. Now, out of curiosity, I looked up some of these ingredients. We should probably note at this point, uh, for legal reasons, slippery elm bark may cause allergic reactions and skin irritation. Slippery elm should not be handled by pregnant or breastfeeding women. Oh, so, you know, just the perfect thing for children to have. Yeah, well, I mean, as long as no pregnant or breastfeeding women are handling it. Uh, on the other hand, this holy horchata appears to do the trick in the book, so the babies grow up big and strong. Chapter 12 is the testimony of S, which is about how great the babies are and also includes an argument over whether children should have blankets or pillows. Right away, she points out there are too many to pick up and bottle feed each one and to pick up and hold them all when they cried. So she just didn't do any of that. When, when asking God for advice, Jehovah said, Thou shalt permit them to lie down and roll about. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Benign neglect is the best sort of parenting. Uh, chapter 13 is Tay talking about the babies who are hot babies, hot fit babies who know anatomy and gardening and had ESP. Oh, and now, actually, one of the more inspiring bits here is just in the second paragraph. And moreover, they were of all shades of color and of all nations and peoples on the earth. Yes, a regular United Colors of Benetton. Yes. I, I did notice uh, they also had simple tournaments embracing games of hunting and chasing, some of them taking the parts of foxes or wolves and others the parts of hunters. I'm not exactly sure why pacifist vegans are doing hunting games. Hey, it's a skill. It's a good skill to have. I mean, I, I guess I could see, like, wolves could be an issue, so you have to uh, kind of keep that population away for the general safety of the colony. Foxes? I'm not exactly sure what their risk is, but... It's, it's like X-Men, when Wolverine chases a deer down in the forest and just holds his hand up to it but doesn't pop his knives. He's, he's doing <laughs> it for the sport, man. Yeah. At, at six years of age, they entered to be apprentices to labor. Gotta get those children in the mines early. And... Not that there are any mines in jail. And it is also at the time that they began to manifest their psychic powers. And we're going to get a detailed description of how the children use those psychic powers in chapter 14. Essentially, they, it's the same ritual they described before. They sit in a circle and then they talk some garbage. <laughs> yes. Uh, there is a long and involved prayer they recite. Uh, here's my favorite quote from that prayer. Sing unto the Almighty, O ye little ones. His eye guardeth over you. His hand reacheth to the uttermost places. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like a bad touch to me. Yeah. You should be talking to your teachers about that. Chapter 15, the kids get to put on a show. Yes. Yeah. An opera, no less. Oh, I wouldn't say I've seen many children's dramatics, but I've participated in children's dramatics, and I know from experience that they are awful. Yes. So I really cannot imagine what a full opera written by children would be like. Now, uh, they did have, they did, however, bring in angel ringers to help with the performance and the angels wrote choreographed and composed all the performances so oh, it makes it a little more palatable i'm not listening to a song written by a 40 year old yes and then instead of the crude and loud sounding horns and hideous instruments used by the uzians for their operas the opera here was provided with an organ of full power and with instruments of delicacy and sweetness, so that the most refined ear should not be shocked or pained by any crude or disgusting noises so common in the Uzian orchestras. Again, I will remind people, played by six-year-olds. Uh, I will also remind people <laughs> that if Jehovah is reaching into your uttermost places and showing you his organ of full power, then you probably should talk to another adult about this. <laughs> and 
Now, as to the plays, whether in the opera or in the theater, they varied on different nights as to being adopted for young children or to older ones or to adults. A reminder again, performed by six-year-olds. <laughs> wow, there is a lot of hardcore pornography in this play put on by children, but aimed at adults. <laughs> So that were it necessary to exhibit a drunkard on the stage, it was also shown how the drunkard was surrounded by dark spirits who inspired him to his course. It was also exhibited the struggle of the guardian angels to save him. Again, performed by six-year-olds! <laughs> this is reminding me of those bits on the big fat quiz of the year where they bring in the middle school kids to perform skits about the current affairs. I, that's all I have to imagine that it's like. And, and in case you're wondering, well, you know... Or we're thinking, well, you know, it's probably adults who are playing the drunkards. The kids are just there to play kids. In these simple plays, where the children took their parts at first, they were taught without books by repeating after their teachers. Oh, nice. So the kids can't read, but they're being directed to play instruments, perform operas, and also play drunkards for the benefit of adults. I would love to be in rehearsal. <laughs> Not mommy. What's a prostitute? <laughs> Chapter 16, as the kids get older, Jehovah says, put them to work. Yes, by 14, they were masters of all trades. Well, there were only 12 trades worth knowing. Uh, now, as the kids get older, obviously, they, they reach a point where they have to be turfed out of the colony or choose to remain. So... That's not really a fair choice since they've been isolated their whole life, so they do the only sensible thing. They essentially allow the children to have a rum springer. At the suggestion of God, saying, The fourteenth year is my year. Behold, the harvest of my labors, who came first out of us, is ripe unto deliverance. I realize that the whole crop metaphor is very biblical. It still sounds a little weird when you're talking about souls, like there's some sort of evil monster that's harvesting children's souls. Yes, and it doesn't get any better because Tay represented the voice of Jehovah and S, the voice of the young brides and bridegrooms who were to speak in concert yeah. with her. I don't know whether I would rather have my soul harvested by God or become his bride and bridegroom. Then again, he's already reached into my uttermost places and shown me his organ of full power. So it, it, I do find it interesting. It is presented as a call and response between Tay and S uh, when the children are right there and can conceivably answer questions for themselves. <laughs> yes. This is basically more of, of Newbrow's repetition. Oh, a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, he, he loves repetition. I, I skipped in my notes. I skipped from paragraph 11 to paragraph 56. Ow. Because just wanting to note in a reminder that basically their primary command when being graduated was hereafter ye shall not reprove one another nor reprove any person above 14 years of age. In other words, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Got it? Yep. <laughs> Anyways, they take the kids on a field trip to us. This goes about how you would expect. It's kind of a Buddha moment where he's, they've been cloistered for their entire life. They go out into the real world and they see sick people and old people and dead people. And as a result, they choose to reject the world. Yes. I mean, their their first and most common comment or question is, what's that awful smell? Yeah. That's not the only question they ask. Basically, they're constantly asking the sort of annoying questions a five-year-old would ask you nonstop throughout the whole field trip. I do have the note that Uz has tiger fighting, which sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. I wish they would have elaborated on that more. Like, you, you cannot just drop tiger fighting in there and then not explain it. Other notable incidents, they go to try to talk to a preacher about ministering to the poor, and he closes his shades and tries to pretend that he's not home. The normal response to any group, when any group of a dozen teenagers comes to your door and says, Hey, we want to talk to you about the poor. Nope, don't care who I am. I'm not coming out. But yeah, needless to say, they find the outside world super gross and decide to go back to their cult compound. Chapters 19 and 20. Because the colony is doing so well, Jehovah commands them to go out and make more shalems and convert the people of Uz. Uh, the most notable of which is a colony called Oleam in the land of Busiris, wherever that happens to be. Hopefully not a medical condition. Uh, children and adults plenty come to Shalem, but uh, the adults are not admitted to join the colony. They're just given a hot meal and sent on their way. 
Well, if they are really interested, they are given the opportunity to do work uh, under supervision. But uh, yeah, if they if they don't if they don't work if they don't show the proper uh, motivation, they're out of there. Only faithists are allowed to stay. Though I I will point out that he seems to distinguish between just the lazy who are given a chance and the poor who are just immediately fed and sent away. We don't want no poor, okay? I'm reminded at one point at work where I was forced to read a white paper written by an ignorant CEO. And one of his rules for business was, don't do business with poor people. Poor people are poor for a reason. (sighs) That is not a paraphrase. That is literally what he said. Uh, Chapter 21, Jehovah explains why no one other than the faithful can hear him. It's not a terribly interesting chapter, to be honest. Yeah, I my note for this chapter was yawn. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much the same for chapter 22, which is all about, you know, don't let adults join, just get children. They're easier to indoctrinate. Well, chapter two did you know have some clues on how basically how to deal with the press. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah the... Uh, Some will seek to trap you on the subject of marriage, inquiring after this manner. To wit, say ye celibacy is higher than marriage, or is marriage the higher? What say ye of marriage and of divorce? Well, the answer is, we are no man's keeper. Neither say we whether celibacy or marriage is the higher. Even though they implied earlier that celibacy was. We give liberty unto all to serve Jehovah on that matter, but in their own way. But (laughs) one marriage only do we permit to any man or woman. And though one or the other die, yet the survivor cannot marry again. But, (laughs) and as to such as are married, they can, at the option of either one, return to celibacy by being publicly proclaimed in the temple of Jehovah. So you can... Only have one marriage, but you can be declared that you didn't have a marriage, I suppose, is how I took that. Now, it should be interesting to note here that John Blue Newbrow was married when they founded the Faithists, got divorced from his wife, who was not a Faithist, remarried a woman who was a Faithist and for whom it was also her second marriage, and then after Newbrow died, she married another Faithist. (laughs) Not at all confusing. But uh, that is a very Jesus-like evasion of the question. Uh, Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Render unto God what is God's. Don't take a position on which they're going to be able to nail you down. I probably shouldn't have said that in relation to Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, they were also asked, well, who is the leader? Who is the highest? Who is the head? And you shall answer them saying, Jehovah, we have no man leader. No man who is higher than another. We are all brothers and sisters. We certainly don't have a ridiculous name to chief who who tells everyone what their job is, who should never question, and of whom we should overlook any shortcomings. Now, that's actually an interesting question, because you'll note that even when Tay is making decisions, it's largely not Tay making his decisions. It's Jehovah speaking through Tay. So I guess the argument here is that Jehovah's really in charge and Tay is just a conduit, but he still seems like he's kind of in charge because Jehovah could speak through anyone, but he's only speaking through Tay. Uh, And then chapter 23, sort of an anticlimax, they win. Uh, As the kids grow up, they become perfect beings, pure of heart, healthy of body, wise of spirit, and the progenitors of a new race of man. Yes. It is important to note that none of these colonies were bound by written laws or had any of them leaders or masters, nor any government, save the light of Jehovah. They certainly didn't have uh, a 900-page Bible to go off of. They certainly didn't have 10% of their population acting as chiefs or any sort of like designated chief. None of that. They nope. didn't actually have any of that. All glory here is God's people. <laughs> Anyways, the Uzzian Sea, all that has happened in the land of Shalem and uh, in probably the least realistic part of the book, they uh, leave their materialistic lives behind and come to faithists with kings and queens and everyone else abandoning their former lives and living as poor, humble people. Uh, and probably the least realistic part of the book, when they preach the word of the Oaspi, uh, the lawyers give up their callings and declare that they've never done anything good in their life. 
And as someone who comes from a family of lawyers and knows many lawyers, that is never going to happen. But that's pretty much it. Their hippie commie paradise takes over the world. Yeah. We, we get a chapter on why Uz is doomed to fail. And then the faith has become plentiful. Uz kind of just dwindles away and boom, the end. It's it's kind of nice to have an apocalypse where the world ends because everyone is good and righteous as opposed to having some sort of war, divine retribution. Narratively, it's completely unsatisfying. Yeah, it just sort of peters out. And he's, that's the end of the Book of Shalem. But it is not the end of the Book of Jehovah's Kingdom on Earth. There's a three-chapter coda, which is purportedly the records of the Chichifs concerning the ascendancy of Shalem and the Faithists and the downfall of Uz. But they're really essentially presented as a sort of Jeremiah against the current state of the modern world, repeating things that have been throughout the rest of the text. Uh, most of chapters 24 and 25 are given over to explicitly calling out the faults of the modern world and withdrawing Jehovah's explicit protection from them. Though one wonders how much explicit protection he'd been offering since he allowed the world to be taken over by evil spirits some 3,000 years in the past. Yes. Specific things that the modern world is called out on, uh, drunkenness and smoking and all manner of dissipation, letting others take the blame for their own fault, allowing immoral activities to continue because the government profits off of their taxes and license. The faithists are coming after you, Pennsylvania State Lottery. <laughs> and the PA Liquor Board. Jehovah reasserts his dominance and that he is the path to righteousness with a really awkward metaphor about a mountain that makes no sense. I made the way of life like going up a mountain. Whoso turneth aside or goeth downward shall ultimately repent of his course, and he shall retrace his steps. Now, I don't know about you, but usually one goes up a mountain and then back down again. It's very rare that I go back down a mountain and then back up. I, yeah, it was an interesting metaphor. It's like, well, you know, if you if you have a destination and you go away from it, you're just going to have to go toward that destination again. One questions whether you're actually intending to go up the mountain to begin with. <laughs> See, the Uzians will be judged for their crimes. Uh, in uh, chapter 25, uh, we actually have another reference to Satan. And now behold what hath been. The prince of devils came upon the Uzians, saying, Think not that I come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace but a sword. I come to set man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother. Now, does that sound familiar to you at all, Rob? Um, yeah, I think so. That is because it is a paraphrase of the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 34 through 36. Those are words spoken by Jesus in canon Bible. Okay, then. Yeah, so we're really leading into that whole Christians are led by devils thing. Uh, let's see, chapter 26, verses 19 through 20, call for the faithists to separate themselves from the world and society. And the final chapters really call for all the unfaithful to vanish from the face of the earth. Thus Jehovah's kingdom swallowed up all things in victory, his dominion was over all, and all people dwelt in peace and liberty. Rob, got any final thoughts? Not really. <laughs> yeah, this is a this is a real dense piece of writing in which a lot happens, but not a lot is terribly interesting outside the first couple chapters. Yeah. Now, I don't think we discussed what book we're going to read next time. No, we haven't. Well, that's because we're not doing another one of these, folks. This is just a one-off, so enjoy it while it lasts. Uh, Rob, do you have anything you want to promote? Where can people find you online? Uh, no, I, I actually don't have anything I want to promote at this time. You know what? There's this interesting podcast that I'm going to be on. I should promote that. No, let, let people search it out themselves. All right, then. Okay. Now, folks, today, so many podcasters around the world still need your help. And through Ko-Fi, you can reach out to one of them by sharing just a little of your pocket change. It takes so little for you to become a special friend, and the good it can do is more than you can imagine. For just the price of a cup of coffee a day, you can buy a podcaster the food, clothes, and education they so desperately need. As their sponsor, you can exchange photos and letters with your podcaster, seeing how they grow and develop. Please, call now and change the life of a podcaster forever. But, you know, don't do it for us. We're fine. Do it for Benito and Chris. They need it. Oh, Ask Me Pals was produced by David White and Rob Brunskill for the Ancient and Esoteric Order of the Jackalope and is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. All rights reserved. All wrongs reversed.